From the Princeton Entrepreneurship Council, this is the Princeton Spark. I'm Wright Sinieras. On your way up the main staircase at the Frist Campus Center at Princeton, if you look to the right as you go, there's a marble bust of a man named Cyrus Fogg Brackett. Legend says his classroom was the first classroom anywhere with electric lights, which he rigged up himself sometime in the 1870s. Brackett was the first Joseph Henry professor of physics at Princeton, named for that large, looming figure in American science. Based on Joseph Henry's work in electromagnetism at Princeton, the unit of electrical inductance is called the Henry. From Princeton, Joseph Henry went on to be the first leader of the Smithsonian Institution in 1848. All of which goes to show that the entrepreneurial spark has always existed at Princeton, at least that long ago. The various people that make up the Princeton entrepreneurial and innovation ecosystem have long been at work taking risks to bring transformational ideas and companies to the world in the nation's service and the service of humanity. These are the stories of entrepreneurship the Princeton way. Hello and welcome to the Princeton Spark, a production of the Princeton Entrepreneurship Council. I'm your host, Wright Sinieras, social media and marketing specialist at the Princeton Entrepreneurship Council. At PEC, we support Princeton connected startups and help to build the regional entrepreneurial ecosystem in New Jersey and beyond. In this first season of the Princeton Spark, we'll explore what it takes to succeed in entrepreneurship from experienced Princeton startup founders, investors, mentors, and more. We'll look at their experiences in different industries, but we will likely see that these experiences are not so different. Through these shared experiences, we will illuminate some aspects of the startup journey for the benefit of early career and first time founders. No matter what kind of entrepreneurial pursuit you're involved in, you'll be taking risks. This is true whether you have a Princeton degree or not. Meet Vitey Murdy. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Vitey Murdy. Uh, when I was a sophomore, I wanted to build a better way to help college students on campus connect with each other. And I felt that when I was a freshman in the first few weeks, like it was this magical feeling where everybody was willing to, you know, reach out and connect and try to meet new people, do new things. I felt, especially as I got older, as I you know, moved on to like my next year in college, those opportunities became like fewer and farther between. Like everybody sort of was set in their social circles. Um, and it felt as though everybody wanted to branch out and meet new people. So the core initial idea for Frenzy was, can we build a risk-free way to help college students, you know, branch out and meet the people around them? And then Vitey got to work. In December of his sophomore year, he built out a website for other Princeton students to meet each other based on their interests, with the same kind of double-blind matchmaking concept that Tinder now dominate. With a couple of friends, they rolled out a big marketing plan, and Vitey went to bed. With great anticipation for half the campus to sign up, Vitey woke up, opened his computer, and found one person signed up. One. But a couple of days later, they had had 100 users, and after a week, a 1,000. After some time, they rolled out to other schools. Then came a problem. What was happening was people would try to sign up for our app, and because like the server was getting hammered, like every time they would like try to do anything, it would take like forty five seconds to get a response. And that first impression is everything. Mm -hmm. So like for a new user, when you're launching to a new school, they download this app and you know it's like not working. They're gonna immediately think, oh, like what what junk? Like I'm not gonna yeah. ever use mm -hmm. this again. So. That was the first time where I was just like, I don't know what to do, but we need to do something. And we like tried to, you know, talk to as many advisors as possible and try to get help from people who had a better understanding of how to set this up. One of these advisors had them over. What we ended up doing is we went over to his house one day. Uh, it was my CTO, another guy, and myself. And our goal was just to you know, stay awake until we were able to get our entire infrastructure off the single core machine mm -hmm. into like the cloud such that each part could be vertically and horizontally scalable um, okay. to handle our traffic. And I remember he told me, he was like, all right, well, your job is to buy as many energy drinks and coffee as possible. <laughs> and so I went and I did this. And I remember my mom asking me, she's like, where are you going? And like, why do you have all this stuff? <laughs> and I was just like, I don't know, Ma, like, but, you know, we could be in for a long night. Um, <laughs> that night turned into 50 hours straight, 5-0. Certainly a risky move health-wise, but they did get Frenzy on the cloud. 
Fortunately, this was not a regular occurrence, but the startup founder's life has a sense of responsibility when weighing the risks. I felt a sense of responsibility to like everybody who was using our service to sure. like, constantly improve it, constantly try to make it better. Mm -hmm. I felt a sense of responsibility to like my team mm -hmm. who like believed in you know our vision and who like believed in me to right. make sure that this could continue to be like a possibility for them that you know we could raise enough money that they would be able to you know get paid over the summer for their jobs and right. that you know the bets that they were taking on me and this concept mm -hmm. would also you know be good bets that would pay out for mm -hmm. them so it crossed my mind the most once we had graduated and i was like you know i had to make payroll every month so people could pay their rent mm -hmm. and like that's when it really 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 hit me where yeah. like if I cannot do this, mm -hmm. like many people like will be negatively affected. Right. Um, I'm like, you try, I feel like you try as a founder to like not think about that as much as possible because you have to stay positive. Like mm -hmm. you have to like try your best to believe in like what you're doing mm -hmm. um, and you need to, you know, try to not let those negative mm -hmm. thoughts drag you down. But like, they're very, very real. And I feel mm -hmm. like people don't often talk about them. Like when I was in school, it was somewhat easier. Like we had people, I would say, taking risks by like working with us over the summer, or working with us during the school year and, you know, not going to like that big Google job or like that big Goldman job or, mm -hmm. you know, whatever it is they're interested in. Right. So like you're taking like a bit like there's like there's some opportunity cost there. But then mm -hmm. I also feel like the types of people we attracted, like in terms of a team, were not the types of people who like necessarily wanted to go work at Google mm -hmm. or like, you know, work at one of these big companies anyway. There are people who, you know, were really, really excited by this idea. And startup founders have their own personal risk calculations to make. So you n never really thought like, I'm going to go get a job at Goldman or Deloitte or something. Is that never part of your risk calculation? Like I could take this like high paying job, you know, I have a CS major from Princeton. I could do that or work on this work on Frenzy or work on a startup? Is that ever a part of your calculation? It's tough. Um, it was definitely a part of my calculation. It was definitely something that I had to like consider because all of my friends were doing it. Mm -hmm. And like, that's like the, when like I felt in college that this was the standard thing that people would do, right? right. Like there was a lot of peer pressure and like even, you know, external pressure from other people who were like, oh, like, this is like a fun little side project. But like, mm -hmm. you know, right. when are you going to get a real job? Right. Mm -hmm. um, gratefully, I would say like my mom and my sisters have always been like immensely supportive of like what I've wanted to do. And mm -hmm. like that's helped a ton. Like I know there are people in situations where that's not the case, um, but that right. that really helped me at least like. You know, worst case, if, if all else fails and I fail at everything, like, I still have them. <laughs> so it's like, in my mind, that's how I rationalize it. Like, how bad could it really be? Frenzy did reach a point where Vitey had to decide whether the worst case was happening. You'll hear about that in Episode 3, available now wherever you got this episode. Coming up next, we'll meet someone who had a wonderful, perfectly stable, well-paying job with a great company that was going to send her to Paris to open a new office there. But this is an episode on taking risks, so you might guess where this is going after the break. The Princeton Entrepreneurship Council, Princeton Department of Athletics, Princeton Association of New York City, and Princeton Alumni Angels cordially invite you to join fellow Princeton alumni, students, and their guests at the third Tiger Entrepreneurs Conference on Friday, November 8th in New York City a one-day conference featuring dynamic keynote speakers, panel discussions, workshops, and a startup showcase. Our venue is the fabulous Altman Building, located in the Chelsea neighborhood of Manhattan. Tickets and more information are available at entrepreneurs.princeton.edu. Welcome back to the Princeton Spark. On this episode of Taking Risks, we go to a different type of matchmaking. This is Daphne founder of The Vendry. Daphne Earp Hopino, uh, Princeton graduate, 2010. Uh, and I am an entrepreneur based in New York City who founded a company called The Vendry, which is an online platform that is connecting brands who are investing in events and live experiences with the venues, the vendors, and the promotional good companies uh, that they need to hire for their events. 
Before the Vendry, Daphne ran partnerships at Yext, an enterprise software company in New York City, for seven and a half years. She opened a Berlin office during her last seven months at Yext. And to be totally honest, I mean, I grew up at Yext. Like, it was my everything. And I, for the entire time I was there, I couldn't imagine leaving. And I think it just sort of came to me quite suddenly, but in a very peaceful way. I had agreed with Yex to basically move to Paris, where my husband's originally from Paris. Okay. And so he was going to move from New York there, and I was going to move from Berlin there to meet him, and I was going to work for that office. Mm. And what I felt happening from my career, which this starts playing a little bit into the risk that I wanted to take, was I was really comfortable. Like, I knew Mm. that I had everything I needed at Yex. I could sort of you know, increasingly coast there and sort of maybe increasingly vague positions as as they were like, go help in Paris, you know, we got you. Right. And that's great, but I was 29 years old and I had no real desire to coast and I felt that it was just the time to sort of say, you know, this chapter of my life was awesome Mm -hmm. and I want to make sure that I can sort of stand on my own as a professional and as a wannabe entrepreneur without right. like the comfort of this machine behind me. Right, right. But was her next move fleshed out? Not at all. So I okay. literally called my husband in Berlin and he had already quit his job in New Whoa. York to move to Paris for my job. <laughs> wow. So and that sounds risky. <laughs> Well, yeah, so that was a phone call because it just literally came to me in a flash. And I was like, this is the the cleanest, best time for me to, you know, transition to something new. And Mm -hmm. so I called Pierre and I was like, hey, I know you quit your job to move to Paris for me, but actually I also want to quit my job. (laughs) Um, And so I pitched him. I was like, look, look, we don't need to freak out. Let's still move to Paris. They still moved to Paris. They spent the next year living in Airbnbs. He worked on freelance projects remotely, and she set out to find her next path. And I guess through through my soul searching in Paris, I just totally got that entrepreneurial bug. And, you know, I love New York City. I'm totally obsessed with New York City and just the the work culture here. And so both Pierre and I, he also, I think, was, was itching to come back and start his own company, um, which is an architecture firm. And so we decided to move back. Uh, I decided I wanted to start a company and I had all these ideas. And so what I started doing was I started putting together pitch decks as if I was pitching an investor or something. And I think there were two ideas early on, totally different, that I dropped fairly quickly. But uh, the truth is that at the same time I was planning my wedding, Pierre and I got married in France, and I was feeling a lot of these pain points around event planning specific to sort of sourcing vendors and managing them as, you know, the event planning rolls out. Uh, And so I started thinking in the back of my mind, like, I feel like there's room for technology to make this all much more efficient. Um, Personally, didn't feel much passion for the wedding market. Also, there's already been a lot of investment from the venture side into that market. Um, And so, so Zola raised $100 million last year you know, Wedding Wire and The Knot had merged. And so Uh I just didn't feel that that market was big enough to merit another big player. Um, But tapping into my experience at Yext running partnerships and then also as a consumer seeing pop-ups everywhere, brands investing in IRL, um, I knew that there was something in that space. Thus, the Vendry was born. And? Um, And so Pierre and I moved back to New York last fall, uh, September, and that's when I started talking to potential angel investors about raising an angel uh, investment round. Uh-huh. Also found out I was pregnant, oh. funny, um, <laughs> which was uh, a little bit of a surprise. <laughs> and, uh, okay. And new companies for both of them. New baby, New York. We were jumping the un- into the unknown, right? Yeah, we were absolutely. like, well, we're doing this and we'll figure it out. And that's sort of how it's played out. I was very lucky, I guess, speaking a little bit about just going through pregnancy as an entrepreneur. You know, every 
woman in every family is going to have a totally different experience and any parent knows that. Um, and so I was very lucky in that I had a very easy pregnancy mm -hmm. and it Good. just, I literally worked until the last day. I mean, it, wow. it wasn't a thing. And we didn't have an easy start to parenthood. Mm -hmm. So we um, had some unexpected events that, um, that made the first two months of parenthood really difficult. Uh, but, you know, you just work through it and we had supportive families and, mm. you know, we were very lucky in that regard. It's already been quite a journey. Daphne had this reflection on it. You know, after you guys asked me to do this podcast, I thought about what I felt, what risks I felt I had taken mm -hmm in this journey. And I think there's one big glaring one, which is that I feel I'm somewhat risking my reputation. Mm -hmm. And that is a risk that I took on without needing to, right? Like, I think I built a very good professional reputation and network at Yex. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I easily could have stayed at Yex and, and, you know, chosen that path or taken another high paying job somewhere else. And instead, I chose to basically start my own company, go to all the most powerful people I know and say, hey, make a bet on me. Will you give me some money? Right. And that is a risk I didn't need to take. And I did because I have conviction in myself and the Vendry. Mm -hmm. But it's a risk. It definitely is. At the time of this episode's release, Daphne is charging ahead and the Vendry is rolling out. You can find the Vendry on Instagram at the Vendry Rucast and online is the podcast enterprise the of the Woodrow Wilson CO. School of Public and International Affairs at Princeton. After the break, we'll meet two men who the weekly we've politics and venture capital journey Julian Zelitzer in an unlikely place. Sam Wong. Along with endnotes featuring books on policy and politics. And Woodrow Wilson reacts. Faculty commentary in real time. Look for them wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back to the Princeton Spark. On this episode about taking risks, here now are two men with Texas-sized entrepreneurship goals deep in the Lone Star State. Meet Marcus Stroud and Brandon Allen, the founders of TXV Partners, a venture capital firm. Yeah, my name is Marcus Stroud, uh, class of 2016 from Princeton. I am one of the founding partners of TXV Partners. We're an early stage venture capital fund based in uh, Austin, Texas, with an office in San Francisco as well, and we focus on uh, early-stage investments. And hi, I'm Brandon Allen, uh, one of the other founding partners of TXV, as Marcus said, focusing on early-stage investments, uh, a lot of which is in the consumer space and the enterprise space, and so I tend to handle some of the enterprise-related companies. The two of them set up shop in Austin, which is certainly on the rise, but frankly, not the most obvious place. I will say this, I, it definitely is risky because at the end of the day, two thirds of venture capital come from one part of the country, which is Silicon Valley. And then a larger concentration that's also in New York City and in, in Massachusetts, obviously. And Texas is kind of, you know, a state that is going through this initial growth of venture capital. I mean, historically, we have had successful funds before from the likes of Austin Ventures or, you know, Seven Rosen, but we've never had venture capital to the level that other parts of the country have, regardless of how you know, incredible our economy has been for the last 10, 15 years. And so there is definitely a substantial risk that we're taking in saying that we are betting on Austin as a venture capital fund, regardless of the, our network and the strength of it that largely resides in San Francisco and New York and other places. But at the same time, venture capital is inherently a risky asset class. And you have to take bets and double down on places that people may have some skepticism about and you know we are you know making that bet on austin in texas as a whole not obvious like silicon valley although they do maintain an office out there but they observed and calculated that austin and texas have the resources to make this idea work i interned in new york and then when i got into my you know professional career spent a substantial amount of time in san francisco in various investment roles uh, on behalf of firms I was at in Texas and, and in New York. And being in those places really taught me that, man, Texas has 
all of the resources has just as much capital, you know, that you would need to build an ecosystem. But I'm not sure that there are a lot of folks that have the same vision that may be needed to create an ecosystem of something of that magnitude or, or, or that could scale. Texas is great in that. Austin has a great amount of venture capital funds. There's a ton of funds moving there. There are a ton of people moving from the Valley to Austin every day just because the cost of living is so much cheaper. And then the standard of living is a little bit higher as a result of a you know lower amount of money needed to you know do well. But being a native Texan, I have a ton of pride in Texas. And when, when I was pitching Brandon on you know setting up shop in Texas, he saw the same vision in Texas also. The two of them are building a $50 million venture fund. TechCrunch says that TXV is the largest fund led by an all-African-American general partner group. As far as we are concerned, we know, as, like right now, we're the largest uh, African-American GP you know, run fund in Texas. Okay. Uh, as far as the country, I'm not sure, because there's a lot of great funds out there right now that mm -hmm. are, you know, building building strong track records, building large funds like Harlem Capital and, and others. And so we're not sure, but, you know, we're, we're glad to be in the conversation. TechCrunch also called the $50 million number lofty, especially for two young black men starting their first fund in Austin and Texas. But to them, it was almost necessary to set that as the goal. We definitely set a pretty high target for ourselves. I think that was driven by... Um, the work that we felt that we could do and the perspective that we thought we could bring um, 50 for a first time fund is definitely a little bit higher than, than some other people have chosen to do. But at the end of the day, when Marcus and I decided to do this, we decided to do so with, you know, a mission and to have a mission driven firm. And so for us, the amount of the fund is just simply going to be a factor in the amount of good that we can do. Yeah, uh, I, I'll say this. I think in life you gotta have big goals. In life you gotta take crazy shots. You gotta you gotta do things that folks aren't willing to do. I think if we were in Silicon Valley or New York City, then and you're playing by those standards, you're playing by those norms, you're playing by what the venture rules are up there. Then yeah, you can call it lofty. But when you're in a different place, a different ecosystem, you're playing under different rules. The LP base is a lot different things are just much different. And so I, I wouldn't necessarily call it lofty. I would just say, like, we're just playing in a different ecosystem in a different world than the rest of the venture capital world. So we can do things a little bit differently. I think whenever you do something, especially if it's atypical or ambitious or whatever word we choose to use, you have to be willing to, to risk it all. Yeah. And so I, I think that if you, if you set a goal like raising a $50 million fund, when, you know, it's not done too often, especially at, you know, the ages that we are, mm -hmm. you have to be willing to really go for broke. Yeah. So, yeah, it, you know, there, there are times I think that, you know, we, we think about what our lives were before and, you know, what we've given up. But I think we actually circle back to what we've gained and what we've been able to do and the people that we've been able to meet. Right. And so risk doesn't play into it anymore for us. What plays into it is what's the scope of what we're trying to do and how do we get there and how do we execute on our plan. Mm -hmm. But if you have to say how much were you willing to risk to get this done, I'd say that we have, you know, will continue to risk everything. For Marcus, his risk-taking is a kind of personal mission. His story is a classic come from small town poverty to make good at Princeton and then get a great job on Wall Street type story. He thought he was set for life. But when I began working in my, you know, my first job in New York, I wasn't fulfilled. I wasn't satisfied. Um, I had actually gotten a very tough phone call from a family member saying, hey, this is kind of the position the family's in right now. And here I am on my first day of work in New York City, really happy, just got a great signing bonus. And I'm getting a phone call from a family member about how bad financially the family is doing. And I just knew in that day, it was, it was crazy. The first day at work, I just knew in that day that my life had to be atypical because, you know, we didn't go through normal things. And, and I think if I was going to be able to help change the trajectory of my family, you know, change generations, I was, I was going to have to be the one to take a significant risk in my life because I was the one who was afforded the opportunity to go to a place like Princeton where those resources are numerous that folks will back you up on your crazy dreams and your crazy risks because they took them themselves. And so, you know, early on, this was an incredible risk. To start a venture capital fund in Texas, instead of going down a traditional Wall Street path, 
that takes some risk. But they weren't completely starting with nothing. We didn't have a numerous amount of money. We didn't have a, you know, a certain amount of capital. We didn't come from wealth. Mm -hmm. But I will say this also. I would be lying if I didn't say we had an upper hand in compared to a lot of people. Yes, we didn't come from wealth, but I also was fortunate in that I had somebody by the name of Tory Hunter and Katrina Hunter. Yes, that Tory Hunter, the baseball star. He lives in the same small town as Marcus in Texas. Tory Hunter took Marcus under his wing and gave him his first experience with venture capital. And now he's encouraging him and Brandon, almost mandating them, to be bold and take on risk. He said, if you've been afforded the privileges you have by going to a place like Princeton, by having a mentor like me, you better take some risks. And so I didn't see any other opportunity not to do something like TXV. It was just, it was just, it was just meant to be. TXV Partners is focused on millennial and Gen Z founded startups. When these startups walk in the door, this is how they weigh the risk. It, it's a lot of different things. I think the first thing is, you know, when a founder walks in the door, it's presentation. So presentation is the first thing that anybody always notices about everybody. Uh, after that, the second thing you look for is mastery. You know, does this person know what they're talking about? Do they have a lot of knowledge in this space? Um, you know, we, you know, Marcus and myself and the rest of our team, we don't know every single thing about every single industry in the country, and we never will. But, you know, the people that we back should know almost every single thing about the field that they're in. Right. So I think that's the second thing. Um, as far as risk, there are going to be a lot of things that happen. Just in the course of running a business, mm -hmm. uh, pivots are going to be required. So the third thing after that is you look to the person and to, you know, the level of grit and intensity that that person has. Is this person relentless in accomplishing their own goals? Yeah. And so, you know, things change, people change, markets change, you know, companies shift strategy, but we're betting on a person or a group of people to, you know, adjust to those headwinds or tailwinds or, you know, macroeconomic factors or whatever else it may be. And so it really does come down to, I think, the person at the end of the day. For partnership and investment opportunities, send an email to connect at txvpartners.com. Many thanks to Vitey Murdy, Daphne Earp Papineau, Marcus Stroud, and Brandon Allen. You can read the show notes for this episode at our website, princetonspark.com. The Princeton Spark is a production of the Princeton Entrepreneurship Council, engineered by Dan Kearns and Dan Kiyu at the Princeton Broadcast Center and produced by me, Wright Yaris. Music for this episode is by me, Wright Yaris, and our theme music is by The Treadmills. Special thanks to Rose Kelly, David Hopkins, Elio Leo, Tiger Gao, Margaret Koval, Beth Jarvie, Kristen Harold's daughter, Daniela DiLorenzo, Megan Donahue, Josh Carter, Morgan Spencer, and the whole Princeton Entrepreneurship Council team, which is Anne-Marie Maman, Don Seitz, Lauren Bender, Diane DiLorenzo, Neil Betwin, and me, Wright Yaris. The comments and suggestions box is always open. Send an email to sparkpod at princeton.edu. If there is a topic or a person that you think we should talk to, please let us know. If you still can't get enough of the Princeton Spark, we're on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram too, at sign Princeton Spark. Views expressed by our guests on the show are theirs and do not necessarily reflect the views of Princeton Entrepreneurship Council or Princeton University. If you rate and review us on the iTunes store, it really does help people find the show. If you haven't subscribed to the show yet, please do so at princetonspark.com, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. On the next episode of the Princeton Spark, we'll hear from two more entrepreneurs in the Princeton ecosystem on how they navigate uncertainty and succeed. It's available now at princetonspark.com or your favorite podcast app. Thanks for listening. The Thrive Conference, celebrating and empowering Princeton's Black alumni, returns to the Princeton campus from October 3rd through the 5th. The Thrive Conference presents entrepreneurial content on the afternoon of the 3rd, featuring keynote speakers, panel discussions, workshops, and a startup showcase. Registration information is available at thrive.princeton.edu.